Welcome to Hello Self. It's a podcast focused on turning your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. I am your host, coach, and author, Patricia Leonard. Well, hello out there, all of you Hello Self listeners, and welcome today. I have a guest that you're going to really enjoy. He has a lot of insights. He's lived a life that he can share the struggles he's had as well as the magic he's created along with other people in his life. Remember that Hello Self is a podcast about turning your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. And I am sure after this interview with my guest today, you will get those dreams that you've got on that someday shelf, take them off and get started on them. That's our hope for you. So today I'd like to welcome Tom Michael Mulligan. Say hello, Tom. Hello, and thank you, Patricia, for having me on your podcast. You're sure welcome. I'm going to do just a little overview, the audience, just of your bio, and then I'm going to let you take it from here and give us a little bit about your life journey from seven years old. (laughs) So I'll tell you more about that. Okay. Thomas Michael Mulligan, or Tom Michael Mulligan, was born and raised in New York City's Hell Kitchen. Now, this is very interesting. I'm learning as much from these individuals that I have on my show as I'm sure my guests or my audience is, because I wasn't clear about what Hell Kitchen was. I looked it up last night. So it's around Clinton, New York uh, audience. I just wanted, if you don't know, I wanted you to know too. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Tom will tell you more about the details, but um, he was introduced to acting at the age of seven. He is an actor, a producer, and a writer. And I'll let him tell you how that all came about. He loves acting. He's acted all over, no, not only living in New York, he moved to California 10 or 15 years later. And he'll give you some hello self moments from his own journey as an actor, producer, and writer. Okay, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you. Tell us about your life journey and the celebrations and the wake up moments. I, as far as I grew up in Hell's Kitchen, New York, very rough and tumble neighborhood. My father was a longshoreman. We were pretty poor. We lived in tenement buildings near the docks. And it was a very, today it's a very different neighborhood. But back then it was very rough and tumble. And I don't know why one, when I was about seven, my mom said to me, hey, Tommy, I am have an audition for a play at the Hudson Hill Theater. And I want you to come with me. I want you to see what it's like. And my mom was a very talented actress. Then so I went with her, and it turns out there was a role for, for a kid in the play, and yes. they said, "Hey, would you like to be in the play?" And my mom said, "Would you like to be in the play?" And I said, okay, all right. And so <laughs> I had one line, and it was a play called Street Scene, that took place in the '30s in New York. Now this was around fifty-five, fifty-four, fifty-five, and it took place in the '30s called Street Scene. Anyway, my one line was. And I, she played my mom. Hey, ma, give me a dime. I want to buy a cone. Oh, right, right? That's great. A dime. <laughs> but it took yeah. place on a street scene on the street in front of the, these tenement buildings. And that's what the play was about. And that's basically how I got started acting. I was in, I think, two more plays with my mom. And then people saw me outside of that in plays and cast me in other plays. So I did another three or four plays. But by the time I was 10... I was all about sports, baseball, hockey, basketball. And my dream was to be a major league baseball player and a pitcher. Oh, wow. But I think the seed had been planted all the way back then. And then my mom, my sister was born in 1957. And after that, my mom stopped acting. Oh, interesting. So that was, I think it was more of a a kind of a avocation for her. She just loved doing it. You know what I mean? It wasn't, I don't think she was really pursuing it as a career. 
kind of thing. And yeah, so that was my start. And I guess it was always there. And I, when I started hitting my late 20s, I started thinking about it again. I started thinking about acting. And I actually, when I was about, I was living in the city in New York and I picked up the backstage newspaper and I saw there was an audition for a play at this small theater. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to go and audition for it. A hello, self, a hello self moment, right? A hello self moment. But the thing is, so I go, I did it only as a thing, right? I wasn't looking to get cast. And guess what? I got two callbacks. They wanted to cast me in the play. <laughs> right? So I said, yeah, I thank you, but I don't think I can do it. I could do it. I got to play so I hockey. Didn't <laughs> I didn't, I didn't do it. And anyway, I, by, by the time I was getting close to 30, I really started thinking about it more and more. And I finally moved back into the, into New York city in January of 80. And that's how I got started with this crazy journey. Isn't that, uh, we never know about the journey, the twists and turns of the journey. What happened to your hockey at that point? Oh, I still played on and off. I was, actually, I was still playing baseball too. I was playing independently. I played till I was about 35 and pitched in, in what they call independent ball. Yes. Semi-pro independently. And I played hockey. I continued with hockey. And then I had to give it up for a while because I did have issues with, I should have issues with asthma and breathing. Yeah. And so I had to let it go. And um, anyway, at that point, I was starting to get more focused on the acting. I was taking classes. I was, right away, I started getting work on the soaps, under fives, on all the different soaps in New York. And I thought, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be easy. But no, it wasn't easy. You know what yes. I mean? But it, <laughs> it, it seemed Okay. And then in, this is in 1981, I was in a restaurant one night and I see this guy, tall guy, tall blonde guy, and he looks really familiar. We wind up getting in a conversation. His name was Rick Johnson. Turned out he was an actor. He had been in the business for about 25 years. Character actor, did a lot of guest star on TV shows. Yeah. So he's asking me, what are you, you know, what are you doing? So oh, I'm taking classes. I'm doing this and that. Okay. Let me tell you two things about this business. Number one, the business takes you when it wants you and not a moment before. And number two, and this is the killer, the business doesn't care if you're in it. I go, what? He said, it doesn't care if you're in it. So if you're going to be in it, don't complain about it. It is what it is. Because if you decide you're not doing it anymore, there's a thousand more coming tomorrow. Oh, my that, God. That what? was like an arrow. What do you mean it doesn't care? But you and know what, right. Tom, those, that is a strategic um, that is a strategy that everybody should take. It doesn't matter if it's acting or corporate America, where I come from, that right. business takes you where it wants you to go. And the business doesn't care if you don't. That's right. Go. Oh my God. A lesson. Listen, everybody. That's a fabulous lesson. You got to be in charge of what you want to do. Okay, Tom, take it from there. So, so you have to, yeah. So with that, at that point, it was a hard hit to me because I thought, wow. But I said, okay, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to continue to do this. And then another kind of a turning point was I worked at this restaurant, Terra Nova. It was on fifth, off of Fifth Avenue and 37th across from Lord and Taylor in New York City. Yes. And I was a, like a, a maitre d' three nights a week. Anyway, I had to wear a shirt and tie. Anyway, yeah. this waitress, Kathy Connors, worked there. Sweet lady. And she was from Indiana. I remember that, okay? Anyway, she my was the shop. <laughs> I, I don't know what part, but she was from India. Anyway, yeah. she was the ShopRite lady. Now, ShopRite was a huge grocery store chain on the East Coast, okay? She had a three-year contract. She was making 100000 a year, and she was still waitressing. So I said to Kathy, what? You're the ShopRite lady. Why are you yes. waitressing? Because I could lose that contract tomorrow, right? I could lose the contract tomorrow. So yes. She said, that's why I do. As it turned out, about three months later, they didn't renew her contract after three years, right? Anyway, so one night we sit down after work and she said to me, okay, what do you want to do? What are you doing? What do you want to do? I said, I want to act. Do you want to be a movie star or you want to be an actor? Because you got ah. the movie star looks. You, you, got, you have charisma. You've got the it factor, I believe. But you could go that way with your looks, but you could fizzle out pretty quick. Or do you want to have a long-term career? And if you do, you got to be really serious about it and you got to start doing theater. 
So what do you do? Right there, she goes, so what is it? What's it gonna be? I, I need to know, no thinking. What's it gonna be? Oh my gosh, she's just like me. I say, she say nailed, that. No, she nailed me. What's it gonna be? I said, okay, I wanna be a really good actor. Okay, then you know what you need to do. And actually her boyfriend, her fiance, Dan Moynihan, he, he came in one night, I met him. Do you remember a movie called Porky's? Yeah. Dan, she goes, my boyfriend just signed a $500,000 three movie contract to do three Porky's movies. And he came in, I met a really sweet guy, really nice guy. And he did do the movies. I don't know what happened to him after that, but he did do three Porky's movies. So. <clears throat> interesting. Yeah. But Kathy, I, I never forgot that. And I got to it when I. I started doing a lot of theater and, and auditioning for plays. And were you and in those? You were in those movies. Porky's. Yeah. No, I wasn't in Porky's. Oh, okay. I didn't. I, I no, couldn't. this was probably around eighty-two. Actually, probably more like around eighty-two. I would say. Yeah. Okay. When I met Dan and Kathy, I, I'll never. I can still envision her set, sitting there, looking me dead in the eye, and saying, "What's it going to be? Right now, what are you doing?" But that a was, a, yeah, but that was something that has stuck with you this whole time because we have to be committed because the business doesn't care. So if you're going to be in, like uh, Rick Johnson said, if you're going to be in it, go yeah. at it, work at it, work hard. <clears throat> so then the first couple of years in New York, I could not get an agent because all I had was my seven credits from, as a child. Yes. And they would say, <clears throat> yeah, you've got a great look. You look good. You need more credits. Go take more acting classes. Go do this. Go do that. Finally, I heard about an audition for a commercial for Co Tylenol. They were looking for a hockey player at Compton Advertising. Yeah. I don't know how. I can't remember how I heard about it. That day, I went right over to Compton Advertising on Third Avenue. Went up there. Went to the creative department, and I said, "Yeah, I'd like to drop off my headshot and resume." And a photo of me playing hockey. And I said, I'm a hockey player. I hear you're casting a commercial. You need a hockey player. And, and, she, and the uh, secretary said, yes, I'll give this to the creative director. That afternoon, a couple hours later, I got a call from the creative director saying, hey, yes. we like your look. We want you to come to the audition tomorrow. And so I went. And it was a lot of dialogue. And I first I read. And then they called me back again. And then finally, the third thing was to skate. They had to see me skate, right? Because this was the lead in the commercial. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, I show up for the audition that day. It was at the Sky Rink in New York where I used to play hockey. I was younger, okay? And I get into the locker room. I'm getting dressed. All of a sudden, this guy walks in. The other guy was between me and him, a blonde guy. He comes in with an army duffel bag with hockey equipment, right? And I'm thinking, nobody comes in with hockey equipment in a duffel bag. Nobody, right? <laughs> anyway, he takes the stuff no, out. He's looking right. at it. No, this is funny. He's looking at it and he goes, Hey, how do you put this on? The, yeah. And I knew right then he was not a hockey player. Anyway, we get dressed. I walk out. He comes out. His ankles are bending. And the director and the producers are there. And the creative director is there. And they go, The director goes, What? Wait, you, can you play hockey? No, but I didn't think you'd find an actor who could play hockey. You know what? You're done. Goodbye. You wasted our time. He goes, Tom, go out there and skate. I went out, skated around, a couple of laps, came back in, and he goes, okay, we're booking you. A national co Tylenol commercial on my own. I, as soon as I left the rink, I went down to the phone booth, and I called this agent. I don't want to say, because she's still, still around. Yeah, yeah I that's called okay. her up, and I had been sending her my headshot and resume and calling her every three or four months. And she, Tom, I keep telling you, you need to get, the, get more credits, get more work, get developed. I call her, hey, her name is Dorothy. I said, Dorothy, it's Tom Mulligan. Okay, Tom, I'm very busy. What is it? I said, I just booked a national commercial. What? I booked a national commercial. How did you do that? I submitted myself for it. Oh, and I said, so I'm willing to give you the booking if you sign me. And she said, really? You'll give me the booking? I said, yes. When can you come over? I went over that afternoon. And she signed me. That's how I got my first agent. And I gave her the booking. She was my agent for 10 years. This is something I want to stop at. Do you yeah. hear what Tom is saying? Don't let everybody, professional persons, know stop your life. Right. Look at Taylor Swift. Look at Tom Mulligan. They yeah. both got, and 
But then all of a sudden, they just on a whim. Sometimes a hello self moment or an intuitive flash, he just went down and signed up. So audience, pay attention to this. Nobody knows what your life is about. So follow yeah. through on what your feelings and your intuition tells you and go test it. Yeah. Oh, P Tom, very important. Interesting, too. So a little bit related to that. I had an actor friend who couldn't get an Asian, couldn't get an audition. So I had an audition for, this is in 84. It was an, uh, the Spartan's Vitamins for the Winter Olympics. It was a runner carrying the torch. And the audition was in Central Park in New York. So my, I said to my friend, Hey, you know what? You want to come to the audition with me? Well, I, I don't have an agent. I said, look, come to the audition. If you book it, and it was through my agent, Dorothy, the one who signed me. If you book it, I don't think there'll be any issue. He's really, you're going to bring? I said, yeah. I'll just say you came from my agent. Anyway, I wound up booking it. I got it. He didn't get it. I got it. But he was so appreciative. He said, man, you made my day. You encouraged me. I'm going to, I'm going to really work harder now. I just was really down on myself. And, but look, I tried to help somebody and yet it wound up helping me. And that, okay, another really important point. Just because you're like, this is to my audience. Tom is bringing up so many strategies and so many uh, ideas for how to live your life for making your dreams come true. So he uh, goes ahead and helps others. Not only does he learn for himself, but he helps others. So it's about giving back to and helping yes. others. You never know. So it's not only taking, it's about giving to. So well, that's another what I always, very important strategy, Tom. Yeah. That's why I've, I mean, I continue to do that. I've, I've always tried to do that. Um, let's see. Well, related to that, I continue to work, work on soaps and continue to do some theater. I, I had one stretch and I've never had the stretch before. Again, 83 and 84, I booked eight straight TV commercials. Eight straight commercials I auditioned for, I booked. Wait, did you do those yourself or did your agent get them for you? I, I'd say four, at least half of them were through my agent and half of them were through my own efforts, which of course I gave to my agent. You know, I See, booked them. Yeah. Yeah. And don't turn your life over to your agent or to a human resource person in corporate America or a coach. I'm a coach, but don't turn right. your life over. Go after your life. Okay. Another important factor. Here's the thing. You can't look, you can't totally, I know some actors who I won't mention, but anyway, they're more waiting for the call from the agent. Yes. Yes. But look, you have to be proactive every day. Yeah. Do something every day. Send out a headshot and resume. It's easier today. You've got all the casting sites, right? Submit, especially if you don't have an agent. Put yourself out there. That's how it's going to happen. Yeah, you may get turned out. Most of the time, you're probably going to get turned down. I've been to so many auditions that I did not get. And there were times where, admittedly, I would wake up and go, you know what? Maybe I'm not that good. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. But my father told me when I was young, he said, Tommy, the one thing you have is perseverance. You have perseverance. Very important. And I never forgot that. And then a friend of my father said that to me too. One day, I don't know, he was my coach, a uh, baseball coach. And he said, Tom Mulligan, you, the one thing you have is perseverance. Don't ever lose that. So yeah, that, I think maybe that's what keeps me going. But again, I had my times where I said, you know what, I'm done. I'm not getting another headshot. I'm not taking another class. I'm done with this. And then, of course, the call comes, right? Yeah. Hey, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we got this role that it takes you back in, you know? Yeah. Tom is bringing up so many tips for you. When you just about have given up, a hello self moment may come from somebody else. So we will all go through the journey of life that it's not always a high. Sometimes yeah. it's a low, he says, but his father said, persevere. So keep going after your dream. Yeah. Let me add this little story to it. I, I use this as an encouragement. So one of my jo many jobs that I held, I bartended, I waited, I worked for three catering companies in New York. And for nine months, I had a job as a room service waiter at the New York Sheraton Hotel. Yes. And I could tell you some stories about that, but we won't go into that. But anyway. I worked there for nine months and I had the four to midnight shift. So one night I come out and in front was the taxi stand. 
So I get in the first taxi, we start driving, where are you going, where, 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 uh, where I was going to. Anyway, I start talking and I see on the, li- on the license in the taxi, it said Oliver Stone. Ah! No, where do you hear this? He's got a safari jacket on. He said, yeah, I, I'm, the, I'm taking a class, screenwriting class at NYU and got to pay the rent. And he said, I was in the uh, army in Vietnam. I said, I was in Vietnam too. Oh, okay, yeah. He said, I was on a platoon. And he goes, I wrote this movie called Platoon, but nobody wants it. Oh my gosh. Nobody, I, I, and I'm not, this is a very true story. He goes, but nobody's interested. And so we continued the chat and he wanted to know what I was doing. I said, yeah, I'm taking classes and trying to work at the hotel, trying to pay the bills. And anyway, finally got to where I was going. And I said, good luck, Tom. I said, good luck, Oliver. And a year later, I see in the industry news, Platoon is going to be made by, I think, Paramount. So two sides of the story. The one side is I, I say to my friends, there I was in a taxi with Oliver Stone before he became Oliver Stone. But what I did not know, he had already w- written the movie Midnight Express and won awards for it. And here he was driving a taxi to pay his rent. And then he did Platoon, finally got picked up, and it went. And so I, I called my agent up, Dorothy, and I said, Dorothy, look, there's this movie Platoon. I already submitted you for it. Okay, but let me tell you the story about Oliver Stone. Oh, okay. I'm going to send him a note because I'm communicating directly with him, right? She sends him a note. He remembered. So I actually got to audition. I had two or three calls. I didn't book it. But here's the thing. Around that time is when I was starting to have a lot of issues with my lungs and my breathing. Yeah. And he said, if, we book, if you get booked, we're going to spend a month living in the jungle in the Philippines. Right? Which is what he did. Because he yes. wanted everybody to really be ticked off and really feel what it was like. Yeah. I couldn't, honestly, physically at that time, I couldn't have done it anyway. But he wished me the best. And the main thing about that story is here's Oliver Stone. He wasn't always Oliver Stone. So you could, I, this director friend, I said, why can't you be Oliver Stone? You're incredibly talented. You write, direct, you, you're DP. Why can't you be Oliver Stone? So anybody out there, how do you know you can't be Oliver Stone? You can't yes. be Matt Damon or Ben Affleck or any of these people, right? Oh my gosh. You could be. Why not? Why not is right, Tom. Why Just not? Do it. Anyway. No, oh my gosh. I hope that this is going to get so many views, Tom, because these, especially in the Tennessee area, a lot of people are moving here now. Because of the industry, because of the opportunities here. Uh, And uh, we're getting people from New York, from uh, California, all over. And the the opportunities that you may run into somebody driving a taxi or working at a bar, you never know who might be the next. So just keep, I say to all of you listening, and Tom just uh, confirmed all this with his story so far, get out there and make yourself visible. Open up to every opportunity right. that you can. I, w- I remember one time there was a gentleman, young man, I was on the board of Women in Film and Television here in Nashville, and there was a young man that spoke. And he was telling about his journey and trying to encourage people at the luncheon. And he said, you know how I got into movie production? And we, of course, we didn't know. He said, I showed up at a film shoot. And they said, what are you doing here? He said, I want to work. I want to work on this. What kind of background you got? In high school, do you know that he ended up getting an opportunity in that? And he said, simply because I followed my heart and just went there and showed up. And they liked the fact that somebody right. would come and just say, I have no background, but here's how, here's what I want to do. And they right. took him under their wing and he's now he's doing his own stuff. So you just, oh my God, Tom, this is exactly what I wanted for my audience is a story yeah. like this that you've been sharing so are there any one thing that I talked to you about before we got started um is 
what is wonderful about your life so far? How would you say that this is probably the most wonderful parts of my life to this day in my journey in a lot of different directions? What are some of the most wonderful parts or? Okay. The, one of the most wonderful things right now, present day, is that I am here with my family, my son, my daughter-in-law, my three, excuse me, three granddaughters. And it, I, I feel much happier being here, being close to them now mm -hmm. That's than I have in, in, in quite a few years. So that, I need to you know, say that. I love them. I love my son and my daughter-in-law is amazing. My three granddaughters, my little one, Millie, just is three and a half. Out of here on Sunday. Anyway, uh, she's a trip. I just, I, I love, so that's, to me, that's a wonderful moment. In terms of, if you're asking about career-wise, I would say in, well, first of all, in 1986, I wrote a play called Just Dirty Laundry, a full-length play. And I was living in New Hope, Pennsylvania at that point, which is uh, a small town on the Delaware River, about 45 miles north of Philadelphia. It's a very art, history of the arts there. Anyway, I wrote this play, and a friend of mine, Paul Lucitra, who owned the Topaz House Dinner Theater, I, I was walking down the street, and I ran into him. He goes, what's that? I was going to make a copy of the play. It was only 30 pages, right? He goes, I, I wrote this play called Just Dirty Laundry. It takes place at Christmas. He goes, oh, I want to read it. Come on, I, I just need to make it. Let me read it. He took it from me, and he, he calls me later that day, and he goes, I like it. I want to do it. Let's do it. But you got to make it longer. So the next two or three nights I got on there and I, it, it turned into about a 75 page play and he wound up producing it. And of course we had to do, as we were going through rehearsals, we had to do a lot of rewrites, but he produced it. I was in it as well. And it was critically acclaimed and it was a pretty amazing experience, not only writing in it, writing it, but being in the play mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And it was done in, in, in New Hope at his theater. And then it wound up after that, Almost everything Paul did, he cast me in. And I, if I came to him with a play, he said, okay, let's do it. I came to him with the uh, Eric Bogosian's Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, 12 character, one man show. I said, oh, Paul, wow. I really like this. I like to do it. He, he said, let me read it. Calls me the next day. Guys, let's do it. Start prepping. Start learning the lines. I had 95 pages of dialogue, 12 characters, right? He produced that. True West. I wanted to do True West. Sam Shepard's True West produced that twice and other things that I wanted to do. So that was <clears throat> how important he was in my life because he was a great director. He owned the theater, he owned the dinner theater and he gave me so many opportunities. And that was, I would say, the core of my training at that time, being given all those opportunities yes. to do all these shows that I wanted to do. Yes. You know what I mean? So you Paul, were in charge of your own destiny at that point. I was, I was trying to make it happen, but he helped me. Yes. And Paul, thank you so much, Paul, in case you watch this. And he knows how much I appreciate him for what he did for me. Yes. So, and yeah. you were co-director and executive director. You were co-founder and executive director of the festival. Can you give us a little bit more okay. about that? So the New Hope Film Festival. So how that came about was, uh, that was in 2009. Uh, a couple of years before that, a friend of mine knew this family. And she said, their son has written four or five novels. He worked on Wall Street. He wrote a novel called Shadowfields. He wrote his first script from it. Could you help him? Could you give him some guidance? So anyway, I called him up and we started having conversations and I basically helped Doug to, uh, to work on the script and, and things like that. And that's how Doug and I got to know each other. And then in April, I think it was April or May of 2009, I went back to New Hope for a visit and Doug and I went to breakfast and we're sitting there in the Bridge Cafe up in Frenchtown, New Jersey, talking about the industry, right? How hard it is to get noticed, how hard it is to get work. And I was joking with him saying, yeah, I'm on the W list. He goes, the W list? I said, yeah, Tom who? <laughs> no, Tom, Tom who? who? <laughs> anyway, and I said, and then somehow film festivals came up and New Hope, again, it's got the history of the arts and Doug kind of said, maybe we could do a festival. I said, I live in California now. So anyway, I left. A week later, Doug calls me up and says, Tom, I went to my attorney. I incorporated the New Hope Film Festival. Let's do it. Okay. And the right elements were there. Doug was 12 years Wall Street, Wharton School of Business MBA, 
one of the two most brilliant people I've ever known and one of the nicest guys, okay? He had that side of it, the business acumen. And then I knew this industry, right? I knew about film festivals. So we right. spent the next year on the phone setting it up and we launched it in July of 2010. And now we're heading into our 14th year in April, 2024. Hasn't been easy. It's a year round thing to run a festival, but we've kept it going and it's getting worldwide recognition. From the very first year, we had people coming from all over the world to do home. All over India, China, Russia, England. And, little new home. and do they do their film or do they present what they've got? What is they submit it? So the way film festivals work is you submit this thing called Film Freeway. And so filmmakers submit their films to film festivals and festivals put their put their info about the festival, what they're looking for, right. when to submit, when the festival is. And so that's how the submission started coming in. So if any of you have a thought or a show that you would like to or a film that you would like to get noticed just listen to what film festivals do they give you the guidelines and then turn it in what have you got to lose well uh, here's the thing but about listen film. might be able to contact tom now <laughs> yeah oh you hey reach out to me on facebook yes. but here's the thing but tell okay so i know both sides because i'm a filmmaker too i submit films to film festivals because some people have a kind of a negative connotation about film festivals. Yes. But here's the thing. It's not just the festival itself. I was saying to people recently, I said, look, even if you don't have a film in the festival or don't know someone that has a film, go to the festival for a couple of days. Spend a day. Hey, buy a ticket, spend a day, see some films, talk to filmmakers, talk to directors, producers, network. It's a great networking venue, even if you don't have a film, right? And if you do have a film and it gets in, great. I submitted I my one project, actually, uh, this movie, Callous, this feature film I produced in 2007, based on a true story about child abuse and family dysfunction. The first 23 festivals we submitted to, we got turned down, okay? And we thought, my partner and I thought, it's a pretty hard movie. It's based, it's a pretty hard edge movie. And I said, Maybe we don't have it. Maybe it's not that good. And then we decided, you know what? We're going to do one more round of submissions. We picked 15 festivals. <clears throat> and the very next festival, the first one we submitted to was the Riverside International Film Festival in California. Not only did we get in, but it won Best Picture over films that had name actors. So 23 no's. And the next one was, yes, it's in, Best Picture. Uh, this, uh, you're right. Your father was right about you. Uh, perseverance. You yeah. continue to do that. Maybe Tom will even run a workshop about how to, in Nashville, about how to go about entering your film idea. We Actually, just, I just that, did. We just, you just did a workshop? Yeah, and the, the, the Tennessee film community had a thing last, uh, weekend before last in Knoxville at Mississippi State. Yeah. They had all kinds of speakers, and I came and spoke on film festivals. Okay, we got to get one of those in. That wasn't in Nashville. Oh, they're, they're, they're planning one in Nashville coming up. Oh, they are? Fantastic. The next one's going to be in Nashville. Yes, uh, it's going to be promoted. Yeah. Yeah. Watch out for it, because if Tom's connected, he can help you. He's got the background. And I we just had a film festival here in Nashville. Yes. And I had producer and a director, film producer and director. Katie Almond is her name. Yes. And when okay. I met with her, the first time when I first met her, we met at Panera's. Okay. It was in women in film and television. And okay. so she wanted to show me a film that she had. So she okay. had just joined. And so we went down to Panera and she had a computer with her and a cell phone. Okay. And I said, so you're going to show me your film? So we looked at her trailer on the computer. Correct. Okay. And she said, Patricia, I shot this all on my cell phone, the whole thing on my cell phone. And she said, my friend and I created the background. We created right. every scene, all the things. That I said, KD, I'm blown away. It Was it a short film? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. But, okay. but she's gone on and done a lot of things. Yeah. And okay. Women in Film sponsored her on one of them through a nonprofit because okay. it helped women in film. But okay. the, she has gone on and now everybody knows her name now here in Nashville. Right. Sure. And not only here in Nashville, she goes on and she's won film festivals. I, I couldn't believe a little cell phone she shot it on. So there, go out and just do it. Just go we try get, it. That's right. We get films every year. Uh, we've already gotten a couple of films this year that was shot on cell phones. Now, some of them are real. One we got a couple of years ago. It was an amazing film. Beautifully done. Acted everything. We find out in the end it was shot on three cell phones. But the people who did it had a lot of years in the industry. They had it planned out, mapped out, shot list. They knew what they were doing. I, it, it was amazing. Sometimes they come in off cell phones and you can tell they're not, they're not there. But still, people are shooting amazing stuff on cell phones, especially the iPhone. And the whole thing about it for me is to get it out there. And you, yeah. it may not be top quality as far as the, the look of it. However, right. it may say oh, you're a producer. I you can never tell know. you that you're a writer, yeah. and this is a great subject. So it may not. I just did a TV shoot at a a local thing uh, with okay. my high heels cabaret, and okay. I remember the person who directs that studio said to me, Patricia. Don't worry that it's not perfect this first time. At least you stepped out and it'll get better each time. That's so right. the, these are the things that this is what Tom is confirming to all of you. If you have this desire and you've got hello self moments that say, I'm going to start it now. I'm taking that off of my someday shelf and start it now. Then right here is a resource. KD Almond's a resource. Kneecat. Uh, studios right. here in Nashville, a great starting resource. So there's all, it's all over. Just go step out and persevere like Tom has been saying. Let me add to uh, on Callis. And so that's the first movie I ever produced. I didn't produce a short film. I produced a feature film. Okay. <laughs> now I would suggest do a short film first. Because I, this was back in 2007, okay? I met this guy, Joey Lanai. He wrote the script based on his life story about a very uh, abusive, dysfunctional family. And it was very raw and real. And I thought, this is a story that should be told because it could be helpful to people, even though it's very hard. Anyway, long of it is, we decided we're going to do it. We had no money. We went to investors. Investors said, yeah, when you have a budget and you're ready, come back to us. And it was almost a year and a half later because we both kept getting booked in work. And finally, it's okay. Are we going to do this or not? Because we could wait another 10 years. And we shook hands. Remember, we shook hands on it. And in front of it, we had lunch in Burbank. And we're standing on the marquee of a movie theater and shook hands. So we're going to do it. And I said, I never, I said, Joey, I want you to look up on that marquee, right? I'm going to tell you, we're going to see Callus on a movie marquee. He was okay, whatever, right? Anyway. Sure, shooting. One of the festivals we got into was the uh, Indie Fest USA at, D at downtown Disney. We got in and we show up for the screening and it was an AMC theater. And on the marquee was one of the movies was Callus. He stops. He goes, getting chills. I, okay. All right. When you say, I'll believe you from now on, whatever you say. Okay. There it was. And it won Best Picture at that festival, okay? And it out of, and again, beat out films with name, talent in it. And it wound up winning six, I think six or seven Best Picture Awards at festivals after being turned down by 23 festivals initially. So now, was it artistically successful? Yes. Was it financially successful? No, never made a penny on it, even though it got on... 35 cable outlets in the U.S. and Canada for two years. Okay, never made a penny on it, but artistically, it it was an amazing experience. Right, I learned a lot, and it gave me some cachet because now all of a sudden I'm a multi-award winning movie producer. Right, big deal. Right. No, Morning. but that's exactly yeah. That's no, it. people started coming to me. Exactly. They're going, "Hey, Tom, I got this movie 
but nobody has money. And they come to you with a script. They go, hey, I, I read some of them. Go, yeah, it's really good. You have money now. When you get money, we raise funds and I can help you because I've connected to a lot of talented people. Yes. The hardest thing to do in this business is raise, is raise money and make money back. Those are the two hardest things to do. Yes. Once you raise the money, now how are you going to make the money back? Yes, yes. Okay? Because I would say, hopefully I'm not out of hand here, but most of these indie films do not make money. Okay? Yes. You need to have at least one good name actor or actress or a name director. And not only that, but the right name. The ones that have, sorry, but this business is who has the most value to a distributor. You, I'm sure you know this, right? It's the same thing in business, in any kind of business. Yeah. 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 yeah, you got to, that's part of it. And, but um, did Callus get me work? No, but it opened a lot of doors. And to this day, it helps. Yes. You know what I mean? It, that's from two, it released in 2009. I, I think uh, there are so many pearls of wisdom that you have given us today, Tom, the listeners about specifically the film industry, but not only that, just personal commitment is very important and you have stressed that and another point you've stressed is following your heart and reaching out if you think you have no chance go and see you never know you step never up know. You, yeah you, you, just no go. it's true you don't i mean go yeah, tell you somebody your dream i just yeah. was on a panel recent <clears throat> or see the panel recently and they were telling me what all they wanted to do with their, they were writers, book writers, and what they wanted to do. And I said, so what are you doing to get out there? You just can't sit in your living room and say, okay, I want this, I want that. You got to take a step toward it. And that's what Tom has been stressing all day. And so I'd like to bring this to a close. Okay. Just because I think the things that you have shared are going to be some things for people to work on if if you're committed. If you're not, then find another career or another journey that you feel more committed to. Because Tom has tried to yeah. tell you the good news and the bad news of yeah. any Did you journey. see Untouchables? Did you see the movie Untouchables? Yes. Okay, with Kevin Costner? Yes. Okay, and Sean Connery. When Sean Connery's shot and he's dying in Kevin Costner's arms, right? And yes. they're going after Al Capone, right? And never, and this, I use this moment. And he says to, Ke he's dying and he says to Kevin Costner, what are you prepared to do? That struck me as an actor, as, okay, what am I prepared to do as an actor? Like, how hard am I going to work at it? I know it didn't mean it in the moment, but it was like, what are you prepared to do to get take down Al Capone? How, yes. how, what's your commitment? Yes. And I always think on that moment. What are you prepared to do? Think so of happen sitting in the house. So that is a nice way to leave this. Okay. What are you prepared to do? What are you, audience, this is to you. What are you prepared to do to make your dreams come true? So, Tom, I'd like to tell, leave the audience it, would you be open to connecting with somebody if they wanted to connect? How can they connect with you? And is uh, there they something- can email, They can yeah. email me at tommichaelmulligan.com, my, my name, just like that. Or find me on Facebook, send me an instant message. Yes. And also, I less, like to say this too about the Tennessee film community. Their, their goal of the Tennessee film community, and Tony Caudell, is to connect people, to create, collaborate, and make do projects, okay? And the way to do that is come to these events, meet people, because things are happening. When you gather with people, a friend of mine, Karen in, Sydney, in California, used to say, Tommy, you never know who's sitting to the right, and the left. not only who's in front of you, you don't know who's sitting to the right and the left of you. And it's true. You might be sitting next to Steven Spielberg, you don't know. Yeah. Go to these events, come out to the events. There's gonna be one in Nashville. Come out, meet people. You know what I mean? Tell people what you do. Find out what they do. You never know what might happen. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it on take, that. But take anyway. a cab. You never know. It might be Oliver Stone driving <laughs> that cab. That is the, that oh is the, most, the most amazing thing. I'll never forget that. He's so chill. It's like, and he had won, <laughs> he won an Oscar for yeah. that Express and didn't say a word about it. Didn't say one word about it. 
Okay. okay. We could talk forever and we just okay. may do another one later on about okay. another subject, maybe one of your films okay. that are coming out or a workshop that you have coming up. But for now, as always, I'd like to say this is Patricia Leonard, your podcast host for Hello Self. Thank you, Tom, for your insight, your ideas, your strategies. And to my audience, keep dreaming. Thank you for joining Hello Self today. And may it offer insight and inspire you to stay on your runway to success. Like, share, and subscribe. And remember this, keep dreaming.